Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to today's PHO webinar presentation. And it's on IPAC orientation for IPAC leads in long-term care, construction, renovation, maintenance, and design. And is, this is number five out of series of six today. My name is Boris Marufov, and I am a team lead at IPAC PHO, and I have my pleasure of moderating, moderating today's session. Before we begin today's presentations, I want to go to, uh, through the few housekeeping items. The chat bar has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod on your screen if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation at the end. Presentation slides and recording will be made available in about two, three weeks after today's session. If any, uh, in any point during the session, you experience any technical issues, please email at capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. And with this, uh, let me introduce today's uh, presenters. And they are Tanya Denich and uh, Darius Pejak. Tanya has been an infection control practitioner since 2007. And uh, Tanya was the team lead in emergency department and operating room and medical device processing uh, covering the IPAC. Tanya has also been the lead for a variety of programs in the past, including maternal child, complex care and critical care. And Tanya holds the bachelor's of science degree from University of Waterloo and master of science in microbiology from University of Guelph. Darius Pajak is an IPAC specialist at Public Health Ontario as well. Previously, Darius spent about 15 years in both acute care and long-term care settings focusing on infection prevention and control, as well as uh, local public health. Darius holds credentials in infection control and epidemiology and public health, and is former member of uh, Provincial Infectious Diseases Advisory Committee, PIDAC. And now I will ask Tanya to uh, begin the presentation for today. Well, thank you for that. Voice and thanks to everyone for joining us for session five. We really appreciate you um, going on this journey for us as we go through the IPAC orientation uh, for IPAC leads in long term care. So I'm just going to start off with reviewing the learning objectives. So by the end of this session, um, participants will be able to identify the importance of supervising construction, construction renovation, maintenance, design activities in long-term care homes. As well, they will recognize infection prevention and control approaches to CRMD, construction, renovation, maintenance, design, and understand key strategies and considerations for ensuring CRMD projects are carried out safely. So just going through the agenda for today, um, you would want to do, we're going to, we did our welcome and we're just going to go through our introductions uh, to the checklist that you've probably been familiar with the last sessions. Uh, spending a lot of time on CRMD, just the bulk of the content and then a time for Q&A and then wrap up the next step. So um, we're just going to go through that and, you know, eventually this will be available on a web page, a standalone web page with PHO and you'll be able to see the checklist in all these webinars. Some of the first series of the webinars, the first two are posted. So if you weren't able to join us, you can go back and check those out or review them. And the rest will be posted shortly, as Boyce mentioned in the beginning. So this is the checklist. You should have received this. And this provides an outline of your milestones as you progress through your professional development. And at the end of the day, we'll review what you've achieved so far. And then uh, we will come up with some comments on the next sessions in the series of presentations at the end. So CRMD is not just about um, major undertakings like construction or building a new facility, but involves all levels of work. And CRMD has a vast scope, but generally involves three phases, planning, work, 
commissioning. And although the active work phase may pose the most significant and medium risk as it involves the demolition and building stages of construction, all phases can have dire outcomes and lead to infection. Even simple things like reconfiguring a room or painting a room or installing a portable AC unit would fall under CR CRMD projects. Um, and all projects can pose a risk and escalate quickly into something more involved. Um, so you really want to make sure as you're moving through your CRMD projects that you follow the matrix that we'll go through later in this presentation. So some of you may be asking, what does CRMD have to do with IPAC? Construction activities involve numerous risks. The obvious ones are to workers performing the work. However, for occupants of the space, most of the concerns surround the potential for displacement for the duration of the activity. Um, one of the primary concerns for uh, during construction is the creation of dust. Organisms that cause infection may be transmitted in multiple ways, such as via dust and aerosolized in water. Um, when an immunocompromised or frail resident population come into contact with these organisms, serious infections ranging from superficial to invasive may result. Some organisms associated with construction activities are difficult to treat and have high mortality rates. And that's why it's important to uh, familiarize yourself. There are two primary pathogens of concern related to construction and renovation, Legionella and Aspergillus. In the next few slides, we'll take a closer look, look at these two pathogens. There may be many opportunities within the healthcare environment for health hazards to occur. Um, for example, uh, such as asthma, pneumonia, allergic reactions to mold, etc., can be a result of dust accumulation and or water damage. The age of the building has an impact on the health hazards, um, especially with related to aspergillus. Um, but we know that water damage can occur uh, anywhere in any facility and can cause serious health risks, not just for the patient, residents and clients, but for staff contractors and contractors as well. So aspergillus, what's that? It's a fungus commonly found in the environment. It can be found in soil, on plants, and in decaying organic matter. It is found in household dust and building materials, and there are many different species of aspergillus. But the most common species you'll probably see are aspergillus fumigatus, aspergillus flavus, and aspergillus niger. Aspergillus sores are extremely small, and they can because of that, they can stay suspended in the air for long periods of time, and that allows them to be inhaled if they're, you know, around, uh, if they're uh, suspended in the air. During CRMD activities, these organisms can be dispersed widely or blown by heaters, fans, or they can be pulled into your HVAC system. So what is aspergillosis? Aspergillosis is an infection called by the fungus aspergillus, and there are several different kinds of aspergillosis. Invasive aspergillosis is a disease that usually affects people with a weakened immune system. In this condition, the fungus invades the damaged tissues in the body, oh sorry, invades and damages the tissues in the body. Um, in, invasive aspergillosis commonly affects the lungs, but can also spread throughout the body and cause infection in other organisms. And it has a very high mortality rate. Um, the CSA standards puts the uh, range, the, three, uh, the Z317, Dot one three states the range is between 65 um, and 100% mortality rates. So you can see the impact of these infections could have on our patient and resident populations. Ongoing knowledge of our facility's baseline rates of aspergillosis, aspergillus infections is important to in order to recognize an increased number of cases detected during construction surveillance activities. So you nearly need to know where you're starting off from so you can detect an increase. Mold remediation, um, in this slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And that depends primarily on the extent of the mold growth. Mold growth can be classified into three categories, level one, which is small, level two, medium, or level three, large. And appropriate measures for each, uh, for each for, or procedures are established for each levels. There are Ontario guidelines available as a resource to IPAC. Um, but it is recommended that a qualified remediating specialist be consulted to determine the specific requirements of the project. Information about these resources will be provided at the end of the uh, presentation. As well, there's a legal obligation to protect workers as outlined in the Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations. The legal requirements include em employers are required by the Occupational Health and Safety Act to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of workers. 
as well, the Occupational Health and Safety Act places a responsibility on constructors, employers, and supervisors to ensure the health and safety of the workers. This includes protecting workers from mold in the workplace buildings, and various sections of the industrial construction, mining, or healthcare regulations may also apply to maintenance and remediation activities. So a little bit of a deeper dive on Legionella here. So Legionella is a gram-negative bacteria, and some of you may be familiar with um, Legionnaire's disease. You may have heard of that, and that is caused by Legionella, and it results in a pneumonia. But you may have not heard as much about Pontiac fever, which is a milder version of uh, Legionella infection, and it causes a flu-like illness. Legionella can be found in natural water environments and can grow in human-made water systems, such as plumbing, cooling towers, hot tubs, showers, and decorative fountains. And these are the areas you want to pay attention in your healthcare facilities um, with regard, respect to Legionella. Uh, Legionella can be spread in droplets small enough for people to breathe in, or less commonly by aspiration of drinking water containing Legionella. The elderly and immunocompromised are at greatest risk. And some factors uh, that provide an environment for Legionella to apply, uh, multiply include water temperature. So Legionella really likes that water temperature range between 20 and 40 degrees Celsius. So you need to keep the water range um, outside of that to prevent Legionella growth. So it's important to keep cold water cold and hot water hot. Um, so it's not allowing the perfect conditions um, for Legionella to grow. So really making sure that your water temperature is set at the correct settings. Um, as well, the presence of biofilm can uh, encourage Legionella growth. And if you're not familiar, biofilms are that slimes that form on surfaces in contact with water. And they can be formed on the inside of um, walls of the water pipes and air, conditions, air conditioners and water cooling uh, towers, whirlpools, shower heads, taps and humidifiers. And anywhere that water is stagnant, if a deadheaded pipe or whatnot, um, that's where Legionella can grow. So it's really important to pay attention to your plumbing materials and to um, pay attention to dead end plumbing. So next, uh, we'll, uh, I'll hand it over to my colleague Darius, who will uh, go through the IPAC approaches to CRMD. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Tanya. And, uh... So we'll move on. So uh, as Tanya mentioned, we'll look at the different phases of CRMD. Uh, so as you could see on this slide, uh, when to consider IPAC and CRMD. So these are the various phases that are out there uh, that we will consider. So we have the planning, the work, uh, the, uh, and the commissioning phase. Uh, so this slide essentially displays all these phases and it also showcases a, a tool that we have developed at Public Health Ontario that helps you uh, go through the various stages uh, the various phases and kind of consider all the various implications that uh, that construction activity may result in uh, these types of environments. Uh, so moving on, uh, we'll go through the uh, first uh, phase. So planning is the first phase that we will cover. And this phase relates to not only the layout and the functional plan for the space itself, uh, but it's also the phase of which infection risks are identified and the mitigation strategies are established. So obviously very important because with this phase, the planning phase is where we will establish all the different characteristics that we wanna put in place uh, that are gonna prevent those risks that Tanya did mention during her section. So CSA uh, or the Canadian Standards Association as well as other standards uh, typically only apply to new construction or work uh, involving significant renovations. Uh, but that being said, even though your project may not be a grand or doing some uh, major under undertaking, it is worthwhile to make sure that even small projects consider IPAC activity and that uh, the CSA standards are actually implemented uh, so that any future needs are also considered. So this makes sure that uh, at all the different projects that are taking place through, uh, through your facility, uh, that you're actually implementing the best practice and uh, the uh, current or most current CSA standards or Canadian Standards Association standards. Uh, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care may, it may also actually set out requirements. So you wanna make sure that you're in compliance with those as well. Uh, so often those uh, can apply to existing facilities as well, which is a little bit different from CSA. Uh, an example of that would be, if you recall with Directive 3, uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were requirements that were put to uh, the ministry that required the elimination of uh, four bed wardrooms, for example. Uh, so at that time, everyone had to kind of meet current standards, even though that was permitted for some time. 
uh, based on these changes, based on the current context of the pandemic, uh, there were changes that were implemented and everyone needed to comply. So there's some variability there. So you wanna make sure you become aware of all those different uh, requirements. Another critical role uh, for you as the IPAC lead during the phase is uh, performing a risk assessment. So risk assessments are very important. Uh, we will review this in more detail shortly, but essentially you wanna make sure that you perform these, uh, these tasks to, uh, to take the appropriate measures to mitigate uh, those risks. As an IPAC lead within your home, your responsibility will include being involved in the initial and ongoing development of the functional program uh, for all the larger pro uh, projects that you are taking on. And by functional program, what I mean is that you want to ensure that the projects consider and implement all the key IPAC features and measures uh, so that the, the build, once completed, actually is a very safe place to work and it actually takes all the IPAC elements into consideration, such as spacing, uh, ensuring proper placement of hand hygiene products. You want to do walkthroughs to make sure that the alcohol-based hand rub uh, is placed where appropriate and that all the finishes are obviously cleanable, durable, and that they're going to stand up to repeat use of hospital disinfectants and so on. Uh, additionally, as the IPAC lead, you will want to make sure uh, that you are familiar with the resources that are out there. Not knowing them inside out uh, is fine because obviously there's a lot of things out there and nobody's going to uh, remember all the different elements that are out there. But it's more familiarizing with yourself with what is out there so that you know what to reference when something does uh, come up. And you could obviously consult with others, uh, with other facilities, with experts in the field. Uh, public health uh, may also be a resource that you reference. Uh, so these are some of the uh, individuals or organizations that you could uh, liaise with. Uh, apart from the physical space itself, it's also important that the uh, those working in the healthcare setting are aware of what the uh, infection risks are. And what I'm referring to here is the actual uh, contractors that will be on site. So some individuals may not be familiar to working in healthcare settings. So obviously there's some contractors who specialize in healthcare settings. Uh, but not all of them do. So they have to really be oriented and that is part of your role to what the risks are. So a lot of these individuals wouldn't be aware of who's on precautions or what precautions even means. So as the IPAC coordinator, you would be uh, the one that would re relay that information to them. For example, if there's uh, a bunch of rooms that are being renovated and one of the residents becomes uh, symptomatic and is required to be put on additional precautions, you want to make sure that's flagged for the contractors so they could modify their schedule and accommodate that. Maybe uh, uh, maybe do that room at the end once the individual is uh, no longer on additional precautions. Uh, but that's part of your role, orienting them to the risks, but also the expectations, including hand hygiene, uh, uh, masking, for example. So all those things are part of your role uh, to make sure that everyone is oriented to what's uh, what's required, uh, not just uh, the staff, but also anyone incoming like the contractors. Uh, so you may ask yourself, how does one perform a risk assessment? So this is the big question. Uh, luckily, the answer is actually quite simple and assessing risk is a lot less involved than you may think. And what makes this easier is that there is a risk assessment tool that has been developed. Uh, and this tool is called the ECRA, as you could see on the uh, slide, or the Infection Control Risk Assessment. And this tool, uh, which we will cover shortly in more detail, basically considers two factors, which you could see there on, your, on the slide. And these factors include the population, where the work is actually occurring, as well as the uh, activity or the type of work being undertaken. So cross-referencing these two factors will result in this preventive measure category being uh, generated, which we will uh, again review. And for each category, there's a list of requirements uh, and that will guide you in how to basically take the next steps and how to notify the contractors of what's uh, required, at least from an IPAC perspective. Obviously there's a lot involved in a construction project, uh, but you being at the planning phase and taking the lead uh, will allow you to make sure uh, that all the risks that Tanya had mentioned are going to be identified. Uh, so the first thing to consider, as mentioned, is the population involved or the risk group. Uh, this list seems a little bit daunting, but it's actually quite simple, as mentioned, uh, especially for long-term care setting, which isn't exclusive or specifically mentioned, uh, but you could see on the table that there's references to the population involved. Uh, because anywhere you are in the home, you may encounter uh, one of the residents. So this is uh, essentially uh, looking at that aspect that 
residents may be mobile, they could be found throughout the facility. So anywhere where they are and there's construction activity, including laundry rooms, dining rooms, uh, would technically warrant a level three approach uh, or level three uh, group categorization for this population. Uh, but I could understand how some individuals chose other areas just because if it's an area where there's staff only and residents are not permitted to enter like an office space, uh, then yes, definitely it may be a lower category uh, risk group. Uh, but it is important to kind of, uh, I guess, consider the eventuality or the potential for uh, people accessing those spaces. And ultimately, a lot of the other spaces that staff only occupy would also be higher risk categories. Uh, let's say uh, medication rooms or anything involving food. Uh, so that's important to, uh, to consider. Uh, so next we'll look at type of CRMD activity. Uh, so this is the second factor we'll consider as part of the infection control risk assessment. Uh, so if it's uh, simply painting the room and there's nothing else being done, you're literally going in there with paint, a paintbrush or a roller and you're painting the walls, that's definitely a good uh, class A activity or type A activity and it wouldn't require a lot of additional measures. Uh, but often what happens beforehand is you're patching holes, you're sanding, uh, potentially there may be additional work. So you have to look at the whole scope and really inquire with those doing the work what the actual plan is. And only after inquiring with those individuals will you have a full, I guess, uh, picture of what really is going on. And that's when you could actually uh, better make an assessment as uh, what classification to put that actual work into. Uh, so definitely there's some uh, wiggle room there. Uh, one, one thinks of a simple activity like upgrading uh, air conditioning systems, for example. So let's say there's air conditioning window units, for example. Uh, the automatic reaction would again be this is definitely a class A activity or a type A activity uh, just because you're literally uh, popping an AC window unit into a window and there isn't really much to it. You plug it into the outlet and you're off. Uh, however, often that's not the case just because there's a lot more involved uh, most uh, facilities, especially if they're older, they may not have that adequate electrical service. So wiring may need to be pulled. And also a lot of windows are actually not big enough to accept the window air conditioning units. So there may be additional modifications required. Uh, so just like our painting example, uh, things do kind of escalate quite quickly. And even if an initial plan seems minor, it's important to keep abreast or keep uh, aware of what's going on with an active project uh, just because often what happens, and we'll talk about this later, uh, there's what we uh, call scope creep, where things kind of progress as uh, walls are taken apart, so issues are identified, and the project balloons into something quite larger. Uh, so now that we reviewed these two factors, so here we have the, uh, the actual uh, tool or the matrix that considers these two factors. Uh, so this matrix is shown uh, as a whole, and as you can see, the risk groups are along the left. And the TRMD activity type is along the uh, top of the uh, table. And the preventative measures or the PM measures are in the field. And those PM measures range from PM1 or 4. And that's essentially what gives us uh, clues as how to, uh, how to act or what measures to, to implement and what measures we want to ensure the contractors follow to make sure that the work uh, being planned is carried out safely. Uh, again, once the preventative measures are generated, the level of prevention required is outlined in a reference doctrine. So again, that makes it quite simple. So you have to think of all the different measures that have to be taken. Uh, you just have to identify the population at risk, the work involved, and again, that could vary. And based on that, you go to this table and you could easily see what measures uh, there are. And uh, this reference document, which uh, is on the screen, but also we'll uh, link it in our, uh, in our resources, will essentially guide you as to what the next step should be. Uh, recalling, uh, going back to the other slide, that the long-term care population falls under risk uh, category group under geriatrics. Uh, the, the majority of things, as you could see here under group three, uh, fall under a higher uh, PM measure, so level two, three, four. Uh, so most of the activities, just because of the population involved, do require quite a few measures in place for the work to be carried out safely. And uh, just highlighting uh, the actual preventative measures. So as you could see on this slide, uh, the uh, ECRA preventative measures, uh, there's an excerpt here you could see, uh, see it shows class uh, three specifications. Uh, essentially what it does, it outlines what the measures, uh, what measures need to be in place for work to be done safely. And it's probably difficult to see, but there are multiple sections in each preventative measure category. 
Uh, under dust control here, you could see that it requires the contractors essentially uh, sea level penetrations because you want to contain dust. Uh, it also talks about impermeable dust barriers needing to be erected, which we'll touch on on the next slide. Uh, but essentially, it clearly outlines what's required. Uh, the thing to keep in mind, if uh, you need a risk or preventative measure category three, it actually also requires that the other risk categories below that are implemented as well, just because they work in concert. So if it requires risk, uh, preventative measure uh, one, you do what's required there. But if it's a uh, preventative measure three requirement, you would also have to make sure PM one and two uh, requirements are, uh, are implemented as well. And as mentioned, uh, uh, so one thing that was uh, talked uh, about in that uh, excerpt there uh, was uh, hoarding or barriers. Uh, so one of the key ideas behind protecting people from risk during construction, renovation, maintenance, and design project is to isolate the work from those occupying the space. Uh, so barriers or hoarding, also called containment, essentially refers to a way of temporarily separating the space where the construction work is actually taking place from the other occupants within that space. So that's how essentially protecting them. And the types of measures uh, or the hoarding materials rather that you could see there include polyethylene. So this would be a thick uh, care resistant plastic sheet. Uh, drywall can be used. Uh, fire retardant poly would also be used, uh, especially if uh, uh, the hoarding or the poly is being left exposed. You wanna make sure that it is fire resistant. Uh, impermeable temporary containment units uh, would need to be used. And occasionally, if the space is actually uh, contained rooms, for like, like uh, for example, if you're renovating an isolated room where there's a door, you may be able to use a door and some additional measures, such as uh, an anti room, uh, which uh, you find out through CSA guidance documents. Uh, so you may not have to uh, erect separate or require the erection of separate hoarding. Rather, you may be able to use existing walls on separation to make sure that work is carried out safely. Uh, occasionally, you also actually see mobile devices used. Often, these are referred to as cubes, and they're basically, uh, for I guess lack of a better example, they're basically, uh, you can picture an old telephone booth, and uh, contractors or maintenance staff would use that to contain the work they're doing if the work is insignificant. Uh, so let's say a contractor has to remove a ceiling tile to repair a valve or to replace a pipe. If they could do that within a ceiling tile and the space required is small, uh, they would uh, bring this containment cube and uh, wheel it over to where they're working and then push it up against the ceiling or the wall, depending on the activity they're doing, and that would contain the work in that cube. And it would, uh, it would be a temporary kind of erected structure to allow uh, for work to be done safely. Uh, so you shouldn't technically be seeing anyone remove ceiling tiles without this or other measures uh, in place. So the next section we'll look at is the work phase of CRMD. So IPAC's role in the work phase. So the work phase poses the most critical exposure risk to building occupants, as Tanya mentioned earlier. And this includes staff, residents, as it does involve both demolition and construction. Uh, so this phase can potentially generate significant dust. It can also lead to stagnant water. Uh, the demolition could also uh, reveal existing issues that are hidden behind walls. Uh, so Tanya went over mold and some other factors that may be present. And that again, not only would that uh, pose challenges, but it, this is uh, an example of where we mentioned that the work could balloon and become bigger than, uh, than is the case. Uh, so the phase can potentially generate significant dust. So that's uh, the important thing to, uh, to remember about the work phase and the measures that, uh, that need to be taken. Uh, as the IPAC lead in your home, you're gonna wanna make sure that uh, you ensure compliance with all the measures that were decided on during the planning phase. Uh, and all those preventive strategies that were established are properly implemented. So in order to ensure compliance, you have to do a bit of auditing by performing walkthroughs. Uh, also asking staff in the vicinity if they've actually noticed any breaches in practice. Uh, checking with cleaning staff is also a good idea just because they're gonna be noticing that they're mopping more, they're dusting more, there's a lot of cleaning, more cleaning required. And that's your clue to go back to the contractor, liaise with them, and have them address any, any issues that are uh, coming up, uh, any tracking of dust, any containment uh, breakdown that's uh, currently being addressed or identified. Uh, that's important to, uh, to figure out just because you want to make sure that you address the issue of dust uh, migrating outside of the construction space. 
And depending on the findings, you may also have to put a stop work order uh, where you would essentially be requiring uh, individuals to stop uh, activity until a breach is actually uh, addressed. So uh, with the work phase during the critical period of the project, it's important not to become complacent uh, since contractors' uh, plans for jobs do change. So again, we talked about the, the ballooning of work or work becoming larger or maybe more involved than required. Uh, the initial work is larger uh, in larger projects uh, would obviously warrant uh, additional hoarding, maybe hoarding needs to be expanded. Uh, but often what happens is that uh, you want to make sure you raise these concerns and that you speak up and request the work be stopped if there is any uh, significant issues that are identified. Uh, so speaking to the last IPAC uh, role for the work phase, uh, a part of the ongoing monitoring of projects, you want to make sure that you uh, do uh, look and watch out for related infections. Uh, so after all, infection surveillance is fundamental to IPAC programs. So uh, this definitely warrants that continue for this type of activity. Uh, during periods of CRMD activity, surveillance should be brought in uh, to include the infections associated with CRMD activity. Uh, so that was uh, mentioned on slide three back in the uh, uh, beginning of the presentation that looked at the various infectious agents that may be identified. If you do identify any lung or skin infections, you want to make sure that you uh, start thinking as an epidemiologist. So you definitely want to think about the person, place, and time. Uh, was there any recent uh, construction activity next to the resident with these symptoms? Uh, was the project uh, related in terms of the uh, time frames and the individual symptoms uh, being uh, identified? Uh, and did, do the timelines actually match? One thing to keep in mind, though, is that with construction-related infections like aspergillosis, uh, there is a delayed onset with these infections. So you may not see uh, the onset of these infections until the contractors are long gone, uh, which is why it's so important, uh, as with a lot of IPAC, that preventative measures are in place because the outcomes that we're looking for those, uh, those signal that something went wrong, but unfortunately the, the incident already took place. So we wanna make sure that we mitigate and have those uh, control measures in place to prevent these things from happening in the first place. Uh, so you wanna make sure that uh, these clinical presentations, labs are definitely followed, uh, but again, prevention is key. So our next phase we'll be talking about is the commissioning phase of CRMD. And commissioning is essentially a process used to ensure that all the work uh, has resulted in a functional space. That's essentially the, uh, the underlying uh, importance of commissioning. Uh, so the re uh, this requires that everyone uh, is uh, that everything is completed, assessed, and that all the various building and mechanical components of the project are validated before the space is actually occupied. You want to make sure, obviously, it's a functional space that everything is working. And as a member of the operational project team, you want to make sure, as an IPAC lead, that you verify uh, that all the components related to IPAC operational components. Uh, are in place and that any corrective actions are taken before anyone actually occupies the space and uses it. Uh, this will always involve a walkthrough. So you wanna walk through the space once it's uh, completed and just go over all the IPAC elements, uh, hand hygiene things, make sure everything is placed properly, hand hygiene product. Uh, you wanna make sure all the finishes are uh, implemented as, as planned. If there is larger projects where there is uh, also HVAC systems, and all that stuff uh, being implemented, uh, then you want to make sure that uh, there's contractors uh, brought in as well as engineers that actually verify that all these systems are functioning properly, uh, just because uh, you yourself just viewing the space uh, and actually having a walkthrough will not verify those elements are in place. So often what you want to do is you want to request that there's commissioning reports that are, uh, that are provided to you so you could verify that all that has been done. Uh, so that kind of takes the weight off your shoulders because you may not have the obvious uh, the expertise in engineering and other disciplines, but that's where you'd rely on the experts to actually show you and uh, prove to you through our report. Uh, and that's how you do your due diligence that all that stuff has been put in place and uh, that it is being uh, actually implemented. Uh, commissioning ensures not only that each component of the project actually meets requirements, uh, but that the system itself functions as it was designed. As system performance can change over time, it's actually vital that commissioning is ongoing and adjustments are made. Uh, so an example of that would be with HVAC systems. So 
Uh, throughout the pandemic, HVAC systems were frequently mentioned, improving ventilation, making sure uh, that your HVAC system is optimized. So all that, even though the system is existing and you're now changing the system, that is a part of commissioning. So uh, you want to make sure that it is optimized, that it is uh, performing as intended. And that's, again, part of that whole commissioning process, which is ongoing even after the actual system is built. Uh, to maintain that it is functioning as required, as intended, uh, as it was designed to do. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is to ensure that all stakeholders in this, uh, that will occupy the space or, or use the space in some way are involved. Uh, so broad engagement is definitely important. An example of that would uh, uh, be having facility staff come to the meetings, as would having environmental services or cleaning staff at these meetings. Uh, just because I would save you from having to speak to all these different elements that even though they're IPAC in scope, there's obviously other uh, departments within the home that have to uh, take care of and uh, ensure that their kind of uh, specialty of practice is also identified and uh, covered. Uh, so with, uh, with uh, the staff that look at facilities maintenance, for example, uh, you want to make sure that they're at the table as well. Uh, because you want to make sure that anything that's being implemented, that there is actually capacity to maintain it. An example of that would be air conditioning systems. So if your facility is uh, about to implement the installation of air conditioning systems, let's say window air units uh, in all the windows, who's going to maintain it? Uh, is there sufficient capacity with the facility staff to actually maintain uh, the air conditioning systems, cleaning pre-filters, uh, making sure that it is uh, that these systems are actually uh, used safely. Uh, so if that isn't there and those individuals aren't at the table to speak to that, to make sure that they could verify that uh, they are able to maintain the systems and also that they are uh, willing to uh, maybe collectively with you create policies and procedures uh, that these systems are being maintained properly, uh, then the, it raises red flags. And that's something you wanna make sure is addressed at the planning phase uh, before you actually go and have all the systems implemented and installed without actually having the back end uh, maintenance part of the, uh, the uh, commissioning uh, phase considered. Uh, environmental cleaning staff should also be involved just because obviously finishes are very important. You want to make sure uh, that the finishes are compatible with the disinfectants that are used. Uh, at one point, I remember at a facility where I work, uh, there was a contract that installed new flooring and unfortunately the flooring was not compatible with the machines that the uh, facility was using that the, uh, that the cleaning staff were using and also the cleaning agent was actually a lot more uh, corrosive uh, than the one permitted for the flooring was uh, so what happened was the cleaning staff decided not to use the cleaning agent but didn't find any replacements so when they cleaned the floors they only used water so that's a significant issue. You wanna make sure that the agents and the products being uh, brought in are compatible. And also you wanna make sure that the finishes are easy to clean. You wanna make sure that there's minimal grooves, uh, that there's no seams, that the item is not gonna soak up any cleaning agents, that they're impermeable, uh, that they're gonna be able to withstand years of use and cleaning. So that's definitely things you wanna make sure that are addressed and considered because uh, it will lead to trouble-free operation and it will prevent uh, tears and other things that are going to make cleaning in the future a lot more difficult. So uh, continuing on with the commissioning phase, a good example uh, of that, uh, I mentioned the HVAC systems. Uh, and uh, to kind of highlight that on this slide, uh, we do at PHO have some resources. So these were brought up and developed during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but they are uh, definitely um, uh, something that you could refer to beyond. Uh, because they do uh, cover general IPAC considerations for HVAC systems, as well as portable fans and portable air conditioning units. So uh, as mentioned in meeting and uh, dealing with uh, facility staff, you want to bring up these documents and what is uh, what it does capture and recommend. So we can make sure, you can make sure rather, uh, that all these uh, devices and all these approaches to keeping residents cool, for example, especially now seeing as we are in this, uh, the uh, cooling season, that all that is actually done safely and isn't going to promote or promote bacterial growth or actually introduce challenges and the risks to our resident population. Uh, so now that we read the core elements of CRMD and IPAC, uh, we'll share, we'll actually go and uh, 
talk about uh, some highlights in terms of key issues that are frequently encountered during CRMD work. So as mentioned earlier, uh, Public Health Ontario, we have a website on CRMD and we do have a vast amount of resources there, including checklists, presentations. Uh, regardless, uh, uh, here on the slide, I want to highlight some things beyond that, but the checklists are actually quite useful because uh, especially being new uh, to IPAC in long-term care, especially CRMD as well. As Tanya mentioned, CRMD is a field or a, I guess a subspecialty within, uh, within uh, IPAC or that practice uh, that a lot of people have, uh, have a lot of kind of concerns about in terms of uh, worried about missing things just because it's not something you do constantly and all the time. It's something that uh, comes up occasionally so you don't have the uh, constant exposure to it uh, and that could kind of allow you to be, feel comfortable with the subject matter. Uh, but things to do uh, that you do want to keep uh, in mind are things I mentioned previously as well, such as scope creep. So this is a serious concern. This is basically projects becoming larger, like I mentioned, ballooning uh, beyond what was uh, anticipated. And uh, this uh, obviously would not have cap been captured during the planning phase because the original plan was smaller, uh, but because of the uh, uh, the project or because of changes in the project, things get bigger and things uh, grow. And, and even if the project uh, doesn't grow outside of its original footprint, often contractors will realize that they're going to have to access additional spaces in order to run pipes or electrical conduit to the uh, actual job site. So they are going to have to uh, put up hoarding and containment in other spaces within the home uh, just to facilitate the actual project being done. Uh, so with containment, you want to make sure that you do uh, recommend uh, uh, the appropriate timelines with longer projects with requiring more solid hoarding like drywall, and uh, not just plastic sheets. So project duration is very important to consider. Uh, another issue is working, uh, uh, working with a project that outgrows essentially its predetermined workspace. So I did kind of touch on that already. Uh, but basically often other spaces will need to be accessed in order to uh, work on a project. Uh, other things to consider. So traffic is an important consideration. Uh, so how will things actually come to the space? Often people think of, uh, uh, don't think of this because the stuff that is being brought in is new, uh, but the uh, new is uh, a rel or relatively uh, uh, tricky uh, thing to, uh, to actually define because even though the drywall coming in may be new, it's coming from warehouses where it may be have, has been stored in spaces that are not adequate. Maybe there's some moisture. Uh, maybe there's growth on the drywall before it actually comes into your facility. So you want to make sure that, uh, that all that is looked at. Uh, but all the stuff that is being brought in, it has to be assessed. And you want to make sure that the way it's being brought in is safely is done safely and also how it leaves the facility uh, in terms of the construction site, it's done safely as well. Uh, cleaning is another issue to consider. You wanna make sure that, uh, that that's looked at as well and that everyone knows whose responsibility that is uh, versus construction clean versus the actual facility clean. And finally, everyone's favorite topic is obviously uh, risk management and emergency planning, especially in light of the pandemic. So you wanna make sure that you do have plans in place for shutdowns, service interruptions, and any potential other issues just because those are inevitable and you wanna make sure that they are done safely, that they're planned for, and that if you do need to have a power interruption or HVAC systems need to be turned off, you decide with everyone what is the safest place to actually, uh, to actually do that. Uh, just because uh, you wanna make sure that if it has to be done, maybe it's best it's done at night when everyone's asleep, uh, that it limits the impact on the residents. So those are some things you wanna make sure you consider. Uh, so although not everyone may have been involved with CRMD in the past, uh, I'm sure you've encountered projects throughout uh, your time in uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, one of the last things I want to touch on quickly is uh, residents and staff safety. So that's very important. You want to make sure you take that into consideration. One thing to just highlight is uh, often with construction sites, you'll find that there's sticky mats placed outside of doors from construction sites. Uh, because we want the construction workers to uh, get the dust off their boots and that sticks to those mats. Those mats actually do create a hazard for residents. So you want to make sure that those aren't outside of the construction zone, but immediately inside, uh, just because, again, they are tripping hazards. Residents could stick to those. So just want to highlight that. 
And the other thing just to kind of quickly highlight is key strategies for success. Uh, so this is just a brief list, but finally, uh, uh, there's obviously a lot of things that uh, need to be done as we've seen through all the various phases, uh, but a lot of work uh, will, uh, will ultimately result in fewer potential infections and fewer headaches down the road just because the space is obviously going to be more usable and more appropriate. Uh, and it's obviously uh, with construction, there's always an opportunity to make things better. And that's a, that's a bright side of doing any type of renovation is that you can make sure that you uh, to go towards meeting current requirements and current standards. Uh, lastly, we do have some uh, resources. So there's resources throughout these slides, uh, but here we have another slide that shows some additional resources that you could reference. Uh, again, this will be uh, posted, so you could definitely go back and uh, look at those uh, various uh, guidance documents and resources, and they'll definitely help you through your, uh, through your journey as an IPAC lead, uh, covering construction, renovation, maintenance. And now I'll pass it back to Boris. Uh, wow, lots of information and lots of things to, to digest, obviously. And the good thing is that uh, we will be placing this um, recording uh, in our website in uh, two, three weeks. So you can come back and then uh, watch again and address some of the things you want to clarify. And uh, thank you very much, Darius and Tanya. And we will now move to Q&A part to address some of your uh, questions. And please continue to enter your questions if you have into the pod. Um, and I will go with the first one now, what we have. Uh, it was somehow addressed, but if uh, we can uh, uh, clarify one more time. With upcoming air conditioning installation in homes, is there anything specific I should be inquiring about before the work starts? So if Tanya, can you uh, address uh, this one, please? Yeah, I think, um, you know, really with any scope of construction project, you really want to do a walk through of where you're doing the construction. So the installation in this case of the air conditioner. So meet with your contractor, meet with your building services or any relevant parties, the manager on the site to walk through the space to see the scope of work. From there, as Darius outlined, you'll, you, you, cut, you really already know your resident population risk group, but you'll be able to fully define, define the scope of work to define your um, uh, construction risk matrix and they're determined you know what precautions you'll need to use as per that risk risk matrix um, in installing the air conditioner if it's as Jerry's mentioned as simple as popping in that AC unit into the window you may not need as much but if it's more involved a demolition or reconstruction you'll definitely need to install some of those barriers as Darius outlined and Darius I don't know if you have anything further with specific to your air conditioner to add to that um, you know yeah I think your best part would probably be to look at the PHO resource that was highlighted just because it does have a lot of things to consider. Uh, so even if it's a simple process, you still have to consider and from like a CRMD perspective, you still definitely want to consider the actual placement of the unit management of the unit. Uh, so it's more about the commissioning aspects of things, but definitely uh, the resources to PHO would be helpful. Okay, thank you very much. And another question is interesting. Um, and realistic, I would say, often there is a pushback from contractors regarding the hoarding. They say we had to build this wall and uh, this will create dust. And uh, there is always and the explanation provided um, if necessary. But if any additional advice, if you uh, can provide. Yeah, so I could take that one. So essentially, uh, if they're creating dust, putting up containment, then they're not doing, they're doing something wrong, essentially. Uh, so basically the, the actual work for creating containment should be all done off site, so off the actual resident care units. Uh, so the drywall being used for the containment should be cut off site or again, out of the actual area of concern. And then when they bring in the actual drywall, they could always tape the seams because there's always that, uh, that loose gypsum that could fall apart. So you could tape the perimeter of the drywall. Uh, and also the actual containment is constructed using metal studs, which doesn't generate any uh, dust at all. So realistically, if it's done appropriately and safely, then there is no dust generated whatsoever. So I think the issue is with the, the approach they're taking, not the actual containment. Yeah, thank you. And the next one is, how do I get management team to consult uh, me prior to hiring contractors if they already have established the routines and companies who come in and do the work 
and but I know uh, they breach uh, commonly <laughs> from Bella. Um, I think the really a good place to start is to really have your committee your construction committee uh, meet together to discuss the priorities um, of your construction project, the risk matrix and go through all the expectations. Um, that way your contractor could be on the same page and your contractor really should be also um, on that committee. And as well, you know, familiarize the contractor with the resource and, and, uh, available and uh, the, what the expectations are. And, um, you know, I think just the understanding of the important role that they have in preventing infections in our resident and client populations, because sometimes if they're newer to the healthcare setting, they may not realize the important role. So I think that education is key for your contractor to understand the really important role that they have um, with that. So I don't know if that's, I hope that's uh, answering your question there. Darius, did you have any yeah, further to that? Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, if I can add, uh, maybe the one, uh, one more step uh, you can do is to familiarize your management, your leadership, that this involvement in, uh, in construction renovation is part of your job as IPAC uh, designated person, as IPAC lead. So, uh, so they know that it is uh, expected from you and then uh, they need to involve you in any conversations uh, around that type of projects. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, next one, should the constructor itself be supplying these containment areas? Uh, what they uh, say they do not supply and um, anything about that? Yeah, uh, so maybe there is. Yeah, so typically as part of the tender, as part of the contract, uh, uh, the contractor would be required to provide containment. So that would be something they would build because they know the scope of work. I've been at facilities where uh, based on cost saving measures, the internal maintenance staff build the, uh, the hoarding for the contractor in advance uh, just to save some money. But at the end of the day, it has to be in place and it has to be constructed in accordance with uh, CSA recommendations. Okay, thank you. Maybe I will take one more question. Uh, we have some time. Um, if we're not building but have resident rooms to repair and uh, there would be patching and painting uh, done by maintenance staff. Would it still be the hoarding wall? Need to be. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, Darius really highlighted that in his talk that it's not always the large scale projects and often you'll face these smaller scale projects, but they really do fall into um, that construction matrix. Um, you know, you'll need to look at the scope of work to see where they fall into. And oftentimes you will need to build your barriers and uh, depending on, you know, the scope of work, which barriers you'll need, you'll have to review the chart, but um, definitely uh, those smaller scale projects really do fall under and, are, and can pose significant rent to our patient resident population. So absolutely knowing the full gamut of work and really talking to your contractor and uh, the unit staff of what's going to be done on that, uh, that unit with that job. Okay, thank you. Maybe one more. Um, so we have one minute. I'm not sure about the next question about the percentage of uh, reconstruction in older homes uh, compared to the new area. Um, so we will uh, look into that and uh, please uh, email directly to us uh, about this, uh, and Jennifer. And the current uh, air, um, air conditioning units required for C homes in long-term care home that place in resident rooms, what uh, would be of the, uh, some of the requirements other than cleaning schedule to meet the IPAC requirements by IPAC leads? There is, if you can yep. address this one. Sure. Yeah, it's best to refer to the PHO uh, document just because yeah. there's quite a few requirements and I don't think we could do it justice uh, uh, here, but definitely that resource is uh, certainly helpful and will outline a lot of the requirements. Okay, so um, thank you very much. And um, we will uh, complete uh, this session for today. And it was great, uh, Tanya and Darius, uh, for your involvement. And as we wrap up uh, today's webinar, I would thank you again. And you can expect to receive the brief and anonymous survey for today's session. Please try to complete this to help improve our programming in the future. And lastly, to access the past presentations, as it was mentioned, um, please visit the PHO website and education uh, and events for presentation. And have a wonderful rest of the day and weekend. Mm -hmm.